Hey class, Travis Bledsoe with you again. I'm making the next video in our mechanical transmissions class covering precision measuring. Some of these devices we discussed and looked at during our hand tool section. So now we'll take a little deeper dive. This presentation should be available in D2L. So you can look at it uh, if you'd like. And in the presentation, there's some links that uh, you can click on to get some more information about the devices that we talk about. So steel rules, exactly what it is. Uh, they're rulers or scales come in different lengths. They have different graduations along the scale. What's pictured on the slide are eighth and sixteenth increments. The, the scale that I have in my hand is a 12 inch scale. It's what came from our combination squares that we used in our last lab. So this is graduated uh, in 8th, 16th, and then on the back side we have 32nd and 64th. So if you can see the along the top line, uh, the top of this is 64th scale. Uh, the, the, line, the little tick marks are very close together. It's uh, pretty hard to read when it gets down to that small, that uh, close together the tick marks. So if, normally during a class, um, I would write up on the whiteboard and kind of break down a one inch increment how we get the little tick marks uh, in the middle between like the one and the two. <clears throat> uh, the setup I have now, I can't do that. And so I have a, a video in the top left, you click on the link, so it's reading a tape measure. Um, that'll show you how to read and, and read the tape measure or ruler and kind of breaks it down uh, in this, about the same exact way that I do. I, uh, the video is the reason I posted that. Now I tried to run the video uh, as a part of this video that I'm making, but my computer is not fast enough uh, to run the YouTube video and record the video of, of me at the same time. So, so if you want to click on the link to, to uh, get more information about how to read the scale and uh, what the little tick marks represent. So it's, it's pretty, pretty easy uh, to read once you learn what they are. So we're looking at this uh, exercise that's up there now. So let's to pick out uh, three to look at. So let's look at letter A, <clears throat> letter B, and letter D. So kind of look at those three, see what you think they are. And I'll flip to the next slide and I'll show you the answers for those. So A is three eighths of an inch. Letter B, 11 sixteenths. Letter D is an inch and a quarter. So you can go up to, along the scale and, and determine what the, the measurement is. And you may have to reduce it down uh, to lowest terms. So here's a, um, a slide about reducing fractions, a little exercise that, um, that you can do. Uh, the next slide is going to show the answers on that. So... We won't go through all of these, but um, this is not a math class, but it is helpful to know the, how to reduce uh, fractions. So let's look at letter C. Um, that one's asking how many eighths are in a three quarters of an inch. So how many eighths are in a three quarters of an inch? There are six eighths. So basically you double the three quarter. Uh, you double the four to get the eights, and then double the three, and you've got the six. So let's go down and look at another, another one. Let's look at G. So we've got 12 sixteenths. What does that reduce down to? What's the lowest fraction we can get? So what uh, what will go into 12 and the 16? Well, two is often a, a number that you can look at, uh, but that's still not going to take it down to the lowest. So four will go into... 12 and 16. So that's what we're going to use. The, the 4 we're going to 12 three times. So that's where you 3 comes in and then 4 going to 16 four times. So that's how we get 3 fourths. Now 
And then looking down the list, uh, look at, oh, we got three quarters of an inch. How many sixteenths are in, um, are in a three quarters of an inch? So you, you uh, sixteenths, you're going to uh, three fourths to fourth. Uh, you kind of triple that, um, or by four. You got three fourths, you got 12 sixteenths in, um, in a three quarters of an inch. So using rulers, whether it's a yardstick you've got or a precision steel rule, um, what you want to do is try to find something to butt your object up against and your ruler. So that way you've got the, the same starting point. It's kind of hard to, to eyeball the end of the, when I say eyeball, I mean look at the end of the ruler and line it up with your part that you're measuring. So if you don't have uh, something to, to butt the two, to, uh, two things together, your part and your ruler, um, slide the, the scale out a little bit to maybe the one inch mark. You gotta just remember to um, subtract one inch when you move out the scale. But lining up uh, one of the lines on the scale is easier than trying to get the edge of the ruler at a zero point lined up with your part. So having the ruler standing up on its edge, like example A at the bottom, is the correct way uh, to try to line up the, the line with the with your part. <clears throat> Here's combination square. We use those in our lab. So probably familiar with those. We talked about each part of that, but uh, quickly go through them again. So we've got the center head on the left side. You've got the blade there in the middle, all three parts are on. So the center head is a tool or a part of the the tool that uh, that you can find the center point of a round object. So you take a round object and um, put it up into the uh, the center head, and along the the end of that, you along the the blade, you describe a line across the end of your round object, and then you turn your round object, say a piece of round bar, round stock, turn it 90 degrees, and then scribe another line. And where the lines intersect, it's going to be your center point. So the middle device there is your adjustable head, it's a protractor, and then on the right side, you've got the square head, which has 90 degree and 45 degrees. Uh, this particular one has a level built in it as well as a scribe. Not all have that part. <clears throat> Here's some uses for the combination square in application. So you've got checking the squareness, whether inside or outside. You can use it to check the depth. And uh, picture on the left and middle is what I was talking about using the center head to find the center point of a round object. So you scribe a line and rotate the object 90 degrees, rotate and then scribe another line where they intersect your center point. So dial calipers as a measuring tool. I'm going to take the video off so you don't have to look at my face anymore. So. All right, dial calipers is a pretty fun measuring tool. It's a precision measuring device. You can get down to one thousandth of an inch. So you've got adjustable jaws that slide out the, the out the bar. The bar has a fixed scale on it. You've got three measurements that you can make with the typical dial caliper. You can do outside measurements here. You can do inside measurements and then it's not shown in this picture but you have a, a bar sticking out the end to do depth measurements so in the middle there you have a dial uh, so you have a fixed scale on the bar and then you have your dial to get your um, second and third decimal place so you can get your uh, we'll look at reading the dial caliper in the next couple of slides this is not a good one to see because you can't see the scale just showing the parts of it. So your bezel will turn. Uh, the bezel is where your dial is located. And then you've got a bezel clamp screw. And then you've got a locking screw that holds your slide in place. And then a fine adjustment tool or roll with your, use your thumb with. <clears throat> so these are accurate down to one thousandth of an inch. And here's some applications for dial calipers.
So reading, I'm mean, sorry, not reading, but uh, starting out with your dial calipers, calipers before you make your reading, you want to make sure your jaws are, are clean. Um, open them up and then wipe them down uh, with a clean rag. Sometimes you can rub your finger over it and make sure you get all the, the dirt and things off. Because uh, when you close them up, you want to make sure that that the, the jaws come all the way together. And you want to look at your, when the jaws are together, you want to look at your zero on the dial. And that first picture, um, if the zero is not lined up, you can actually rotate the, the dial to line up the needle with the zero and then lock your bezel down. So on this slide, we'll, we'll look at uh, how to read the dial caliper. So we've got a picture of the dial caliper going out to, see the one, it's a whole inch. So you pass the one, that's a whole inch. So you can write it out as uh, one decimal and everything uh, to the right of the one will be uh, past the decimal place to the right of the decimal place. So each one of those little tick marks past the one represent one hundred thousandths. So you see three tick marks. So you're going to write that out as 1.3. Then you go to your dial to get your uh, hundredth and thousandths place, which would be your second and third decimal place. So it's 15. So we're going to write that out as 1.315. So take a moment to see what the reading of this scale is. All right. It is, uh, you see the one inch. So it's going to be a, uh, your whole number is going to be one. So we're going to write it out as one decimal. And everything to the right of that, um, of one will be to the right of the decimal place. And you've got six tick marks. From here to here, here's number six. So you've got, uh, you'll write this out as 1.6. And then you come to the, the dial to get your um, hundredth and thousandths place. So we've got a 20. So we're going to write this out as 1.620. Okay, micrometers, these are another precision measuring tool um, where a dial caliper could do outside, inside, and depth measurements. Micrometers, you got to have separate ones to do each. So we're looking at uh, pictures of the, at the top one is uh, outside measuring micrometer. The middle one is an inside, and the bottom one is a depth. If you can read one, you can read them all. Um, but the depth micrometer, the scale, is in reverse. And it goes from zero on the right-hand side and increases in, num in numbers to from right to left. We'll look at how to read those in the next couple slides. Um, but the top one is your outside micrometer. That's what we'll basically look at as we learn to read those, but they read in one inch increments. All micrometers read in one inch increments. Um, the thing about the, the outside micrometers, when it has a horseshoe, you have to have um, a full set of those. So that top one only reads from zero to one. If you need to measure from a one to two inch, then you have to have a, another micrometer and then another. Keep going up. Where the Inside and the depth, they come in sets. So you get one micrometer head and you get interchangeable rods. And it shows pictures in the next couple of slides about those. <clears throat> so here's a little animated um, slide about uh, how the micrometer works. You've got the thimble that's turning and the thimble's, thimble's turning on threads inside of that. So it pushes the spindle up against your part that you're trying to measure. And a lock nut there in the middle 
what that's for is if you take a measurement that you can't actually get get over to look at you can uh, take the measurement hit the lock push the lock nut to lock it down and then uh, raise the micrometer up to eye level or some you know whatever the case is um, to hold the hold it in place to, to read make your reading uh, the ratchet on the end not all micrometers have that but that's a nice feature especially for for beginners with micrometers um, the thimble as I mentioned are, is running on threads so a ratchet helps with uh, prevent over tightening so it's kind of it's kind of a break it, it's like a torque wrench it, it breaks loose when the uh, when the right amount of torque is achieved Here's inside micrometers and the applications for those. We've got the extension rods that uh, makes it different lengths. In depth micrometers, again, the extension rods are interchangeable and they're one inch increments. Let's get into reading the micrometer. So here we're looking at a micrometer and it shows the larger numbers. The larger numbers represent 100 thousandths. So again, remember these measure in one inch increments. So we're not really worried about what's uh, to the left of the decimal place or the whole number. We're interested in learning about how to read from the right of the decimal place, which is um, going to be out to a, a thousandths to begin with. And then we'll look at how to read out to the ten thousandths using a veneer scale. So we've got uh, this this scale and the, our top arrow is pointing to the number one, which represents 100 thousandths or 0 0.100, or in short, it's 0.1. The little tick marks that's in between the zero and the one um, represent 25 thousandths. So one way I like to explain this, uh, there's a couple slides after this explain it a little bit different ways, but one way you can look at this is uh, think about this one as being one dollar, and then each one of these little tick marks being 25 cents. So you've got four in the middle make up the dollar. So here's 25 cents and 25, 25, and then the dollar. So you've got uh, 25 thousandths here, 50 thousandths, 75 thousandths, and then 100 thousandths. And it starts over again. You've got 125, 150, 175, and then 200. Well, you know, you can look at that as $2. Just one way maybe to help remember it. So here's a slide that's going to show you um, colored in 25 thousandths and another 25, this makes 50. And another 25 makes 75 thousandths. And another 25 makes 100 thousandths. Written out as 0 0.100. So reading this scale, um, we're looking at this scale. You've got the fixed scale along uh, with the larger numbers representing the 100 thousandths. Then on the, the right side, you've got your thimble that rotates. So this is your, uh, I refer to it as a rotating scale or scale number three, or I'm sorry, scale number two that I refer to. Um, scale number three to be the veneer scale we'll look at in a minute. Um, so your rotating scale uh, is each one of those lines represent one thousandth of an inch. And there's 25 of those around the thimble. So look at uh, the mathematical way of calculating what the micrometer is reading. So on the right side, you can see there's three sets of numbers. Uh, they're color coded to the arrows pointing to. So as I mentioned, the the big numbers along the fixed scale represent um, the hundred thousandths. So we're pointing it to five. That's five hundred thousandths. So through the mathematical way, you can write that out in three. Uh, three segments you got the 500 thousandths and then those little tick marks past the 500 or past the five will be 25 thousandths each so that's showing the third one which will be 75 thousandths and then you go to the rotating scale you got seven lined up so it's 
seven thousandths are written out as 0 0.007. So you can add all those those three numbers up and get 582 thousandths. So as you use these more often, you you really won't have to do the addition. It'll just kind of all click into your head how everything rolls together. The more you use them, the, the more you get used to adding those numbers up quickly. So this one, uh, you got the two that's visible, and so you're two hundred thousandths. You got a one tick mark past that. That is twenty-five thousandths. Then we're sitting right on the zero for a rotating scale. So you're adding the two hundred thousandths and the twenty-five thousandths for two hundred and twenty-five thousandths. Then you've got uh, this one written out as uh, right on the one hundred thousandths mark. And then we do, we're not past the tick mark on the fixed scale. So we go to our rotating scale and then it's sitting on 10. So you're going to add the 100 and the 10 thousandths together for 110 thousandths. So now we're going to get into looking at vernier scales. This is going to give us our fourth decimal place. And don't get confused about this. We we read this scale, uh, this micrometer, exactly the same all the way up till your thousandths place, and then all basically all we're doing is adding uh, ten thousandths decimal place. We're going out four decimal places, so it's really not much difference. So what we're doing with the Vernier scale, and not all micrometers have this. Some do, some don't. Um, is a third scale that when you roll it back, you can you can see a set of lines and numbers. And what we're trying to do is find two lines that line up with our thimble lines. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find a line of a veneer scale that lines up with the line on our thimble. And this picture, it looks like, uh, from my view, it looks like maybe the the three that's lining up. So on that particular one. So we would use the number three. Of course, the number three is not stamped into it. It's going two, four, six, but there's lines representing that. So let's not get hung up on that one. Let's move on to this one. It's a little bit easier to, to read. So we've got, um, we're going to look at the bottom picture at this this time. So we're going to read this one just like we did to start out with. You've got, uh, you see the four. You see the five coming into view, and a lot of people get confused sometimes and think it's, if you see a number coming in the view, that that's what it is. You need to make sure that the line that the number represents actually in view. In this case, it's not. So we're going to write this out as 400 thousandths. And then we're three tick marks past the four. So we're going to write it out as our second edition number is 0 0.075, 75 thousandths. And then we come on out to the rotating scale. And notice we're in between the eight and the nine, we're not right on either one of them. We're closer to the nine, but what we're going to do is add the eight thousandths. I always go to the lowest number, add the eight thousandths um, to to the four hundred thousandths and seventy-five thousandths. So that's going to give us four hundred and eighty-three thousandths of an inch. But since we're between the eight and the nine, that's where the veneer scale comes in. It gives us a more precise number, and it takes us out one decimal, one more decimal place. It gives us ten thousandths. So look at the the picture on the top, where it's in the bubble. That is a scale as you rotate the actual micrometer around. You see that scale. You're trying to find the the line of the veneer scale that matches the thimble lines, and in this case, it's the eight. So you take the eight from the veneer micrometer scale and you can either do the addition method of writing this out as 0 0.0008, or you can just add the 8 onto the, the number that you've already got, which is 483 thousandths. So you'd write this out as 0 0.4838. 0 0.43, I'm sorry, 0 0.4838. It's getting late at night. All right, here's another example. So on the left side, we look at this for near micrometer. We've got, uh, see the twos, 200 thousandths. 
two tick marks past that. So we're at 250 thousandths. Then we see the five. So we're between the five and six. So we, we add in the five. Always a lower number. So we got 255 thousandths. So moving over to the right side, you've got the linear scale drawn in. And um, so it's just going to give us a fourth decimal place. Don't let this confuse you. It seems like every every semester we've got some folks that get really confused about the the um, veneer scale that's on top. So we're going out to ten thousandths. So we're going to find a line on the veneer scale that lines up with the thimble scale. Looks like the number eight does on this example. So what we're going to do is I'm going to, you can mathematically add it in or you can just stick it on the end of the 255,000. So it's going to be written out as 0 0.2558. If you do the mathematical steps like we did at the beginning, uh, this addition would be 0 0.0008. So 8 ten thousandths. Written out as and added all together 0 0.2558. Okay, everything we've talked about has been from the American Standard measurement, um, but there are metric micrometers as well. Um, not really teaching a whole lot about that. We don't use them in our labs, but I've got some slides in here for you to to know how to read them in case you go into that in an industry that you need to use metric micrometers. And they're pretty simple to read. That's what you know uh, what the lines represent. So. Um, this is really only slide, I've got two slides, I think, of the metric micrometer, so I'll talk through this one. So you see the, see the fixed scale, it's off to the left, it goes 0, 5, 10. So you're looking at those uh, vertical lines that's coming up from the horizontal line, the vertical lines on top. Those represent whole millimeters. So you've got... Um, from zero, you've got uh, all the little tick marks there up to five. Each one of those are whole millimeters, one, two, three, four, five. And then the lines on the bottom, if you notice, they're in the middle of the ones on top. So those are the halves. So if you look at the bottom scale, you've got a half a millimeter, and then you've got 1.5 millimeters, and then 2.5 millimeters going across the bottom of that. So that's what the rep the bottom ones represent is half a millimeter. So let's make the uh, reading for this micrometer. So looking at the top top row of the vertical lines, you've got the 10 visible and you've got uh, two more marks past that and that's going to be 12 millimeters. And then you look at the bottom and you see the half um, indicator or a half tick mark uh, visible. So that's going to be 12.5. Then you go to your rotating scale and you've got uh, 15 and 16. Make sure you count in the correct direction. Somebody, somebody may just glance at that and think it's a 14, but it's actually, if you notice how the, the numbers are increasing, it's a 16. So it's point, uh, no, 12.5, I'm sorry, 12.5 plus the 16. So it's 12.66 uh, is the number for that. Now this one, they kind of split hairs with it. If you look at the reading, you've got 15, 16. You've got the 16 showing, so 16 millimeters, but you do not have the half millimeter showing at the bottom. Um, so we're, we're looking at the rotating scale now. We've got a twin to 35 and a 36, so we add in the 35. But what they're doing here is kind of making a guesstimate, if you will, since we don't have a veneer scale on this metric micrometer. Since it's between the 35 and the 36, it does appear to be right in the middle. So they're adding in an extra decimal place as a 5. So right now it's 16.355. Okay, telescoping gauges, these are pretty neat devices. Um, they're spring-loaded. And I'll try to get these out in the lab to let you look at them. Um, so looking at that, I believe we'll cover those in our hand tools section but uh, again i'll kind of explain what they're doing here um, these are different sizes and the rods and uh, i guess the the horizontal part of the t the top part of the t of what you're looking at um those are spring-loaded rods that go in and out so 
So you, you push those in with your fingers and then the little knob at the bottom of that, you can tighten that down and it holds those spring loaded rods in. And then you notice the picture down in the bottom right, uh, they're measuring the inside uh, section of pipe. So you're, they're putting the telescoping gauges, they're pushing the, uh, the spring loaded sections all the way in, tightening down the knob on the end. Then you put the the telescope engages down into the section that you want to measure, and then you release that locking knob, which is at that man's right hand thumb. Release that locking uh, knob, and then that uh, releases the springs, and the little rods pop out to the inside diameter of that pipe. It's actually touching the pipe now. So then you lock the locking nut back down, or lock it back and then remove the telescope engages from the pipe and basically it's transposing the inside diameter and now you use the dial caliper or a micrometer to make the measurement of the telescope engage. Um, this will be the case if you don't have um, something like an inside micrometer if you don't have that available these telescope engages will be the next next thing to use to get the inside measurement of a round object or a square object if you, if you need to do it with a square but um, to do square objects it's more likely to get off uh, so there's actually designed to do round objects and if you can notice in the pictures uh, on the left side of all the different ones that end right here is actually rounded just a little bit and that uh, that helps you re remove the telescope engage from the pipe diameter. So basically, what you do is just kind of um, roll it out instead of pulling it straight up. You'd kind of roll it out, and those little rounded edges helps you do that. <clears throat> Inside diameters. Um, so, so I just talked through all of that. Ball gauges, same principle as the telescoping gauges, just on a smaller scale. Telescoping gauges, I believe, go down to 5 sixteenths of an inch. So if you need to get down smaller than that, use ball gauges. It's basically just transposing the inside diameter of a hole and using uh, an outside measuring tool like uh, calipers or micrometers to measure that. Dial indicators, these are used. Um, basically, as I said, you've got uh, different applications and different configurations, I guess would be a better word. Um, you can mount these on magnetic bases or you can mount these on clamps. And the best example to use for that would be like to check the runout of a shaft. And what I mean by runout, if you've got a, a shaft on a gearbox or a shaft on a motor, electric motor, this, you know, the shaft sticks out from the end of that, or any type of, you know, rotating equipment, a pump or, or something like that, that you suspect the shaft is bent. You can use the, the dial indicator to check how much it's bent and check the run out. So what you're going to do is uh, this bottom section right here along the, the, uh, the underneath, um, there's pieces that come with this that clamp onto that and you can get different configurations a magnetic base to, to stick it if you've got a, um, a place to you know a metal object to stick it to or clamps that you need to clamp it onto something but basically what you're trying to do is get the the button on the back side of the dial indicator to press against the shaft just a little bit so as you press the button against the shaft, and it's going to make the needle move. You don't want to push it all the way to the bottom and the button out. The button goes in and out to the back side of the, of the dial indicator. There's some versions that have the button coming out of the bottom of it. These particular ones have it coming out of the back. So as you get your magnetic base or your clamp in place to, to measure your run out, you press the button against the shaft. The needle's going to move. You don't want to, you want to push the button in about halfway, and then you want to line up your bezel. You can turn your your bezel or the uh, 
the measuring part of the dial you can actually spin that around to match up to the needle so once you get your uh, button set against your shaft you spin your your measuring dial around to line up to the zero and then you start to rotate your shaft really slow and if the shaft is bent as the, as the, the bent part uh, flexes away from or toward the dial indicator you're going to see that um, that reflection uh, show up on the the needle as it moves back and forth so if the shaft is bent it's going to push the button either in or let the button go out because it's kind of spring loaded um, so you're going to see a difference in your in your needle and you can tell how many thousands that the the shaft is bent it's called run out so here's some additional resources i uh, hope the link still work i've not checked them lately um, youtube changes the links out sometimes or removes videos or for whatever reason so hopefully these work for you uh, we'll have zoom meeting um, coming up hopefully soon i'll post all that on d2l really don't have a good schedule yet um, so anyway i hope everybody's doing well and uh, we'll get back together and do a lab on this precision measuring um, got a pretty good lab for that one our next section i do not have a very good lab for that it just the the subject and what we have in the lab uh, just not very good but we do have a pretty good one for the precision measuring so anyway, i hope everybody's doing well give me feedback on this video if you like it don't like it uh, need something changed um, whatever anyway hope everybody's doing well hope to see you soon bye bye